Arne Swinnen, and I'm going to talk about some vulnerabilities I found during uh, bug bounty hunting in Instagram. So who am I? I'm uh, Arne from Belgium. I'm 27 years old, and I've been an IT security consultant for a couple of years now. I work for Anviso, which is an IT security consultancy company in Belgium. And you probably don't know me, but uh, if you have ever heard of me, it's, it might be because of a, a talk I gave at Black Hat two years ago uh, about antivirus detection evasion or an event that I've been uh, organizing the, the past two years now for my employer, which is called uh, Cybersecurity Challenge Belgium. It's actually a CTF kind of a, a, a game for uh, Belgian students exclusively. Anyone who, who joined the CTF of OWASP today or, or yesterday? No one? Yeah, you, should, you might give it a go. It's, uh, it's fun. So as I, as I mentioned, the talk will be about vulnerabilities uh, found during bug bounty hunting. Uh, I f will first give an introduction about bug bounty hunting, my motivations, the goals, and also an introduction to the target that I chose, which is Instagram. Then I'll go through some technical hurdles that I had to overcome to effectively pen test this uh, application and the mobile application. So man in the middle and, and signature key phishing will be uh, some parts that I will discuss. And then I'll go over the 10 vulnerabilities for which I've received a, report, a reward from, uh, from Facebook up until now. So quite a lot of cover, and I'll conclude with a small conclusion and a Q&A uh, questions. So bug bounty hunting. Who in the room has ever bug bounty hunted before? OK. Every conference, more and more hands get raised, so that's a, a good sign. Basically, what is bug bounty hunting? It's looking for vulnerabilities in production environments of companies. Uh, Facebook, Google have, have public bug bounty programs, and many, many companies are currently starting uh, uh, bug bounty programs on uh, middleware programs such as HackerOne and BugCrowd, or on their own website. Why did I get into it? Well, basically, I'm doing pen testing for, uh, for a living, so I'm naturally interested in breaking things. And I also like to do capture the flags, and a bug bounty hunting uh, uh, event or bug bounty hunting is basically pen testing or capture the flagging, but for real. And you might get a, uh, some profit out of it, so that's also a, a nice feature, of course. Um, when did I do it? Well, actually, I'm working full time, so I did it in, uh, in my free time, in my leisure time. Uh, I started last April, uh, or so April of last year, and I spent around more or less six weeks uh, uh, investigating Instagram, the target that I'm discussing today. So uh, I, I sacrificed some of my vacations, but uh, it was worth it. So Instagram, what do you need to know? Who of you has an Instagram account? OK, not too many. OK. Um, basically, I don't think it needs an introduction. It's uh, Facebook for uh, mobile uh, pictures. It's getting uh, more and more popular. And the reason that I chose it is because I didn't see too many write-ups of vulnerabilities that were found in Instagram before. So I figured, or it is very secure, or nobody has given it a proper look yet. And it was also uh, included in Facebook Bugs Bounty program. What do you need to know about Instagram? Basically, it's a very simple application. You can upload pictures, and you can share it with either the world, if you have a public account, so the pictures are, are publicly available, or only with your friend, friends that you have to allow uh, if you have a private account. So that's the authorization model. It's extremely simple. So the technical setup, as I've promised you. Um, Instagram, I, I didn't have a, an Instagram account myself. I never used it, so basically I didn't know any of, uh, of the functionality. So I went ahead, I, I browsed to their homepage, and I wanted to register an account. But basically in the time, in April 2015, it told me you cannot register online. So you cannot register from a, a desktop. You really have to use the mobile application. This has changed now because uh, since a couple of months ago, they also uh, enabled uh, registration on the mobile, uh, on the desktop website, and I found a vulnerability in there, but that's, uh, that's for later. But thus, I had to get myself a, a test device and uh, make myself a, an account on, uh, on uh, the Android application, because I, I, I do prefer Android. I have more experience with Android than iOS. So I went ahead, and of course, if you're penetration testing, you want to test most of the functionality. With Instagram, the bulk of the functionality is in the mobile applications. It's in the, the iOS uh, application, in the Android application, and the web is mainly to view the, the pictures. But for example, you cannot upload a picture from a, from the, a web browser from a desktop system. You really need uh, the mobile application. So in order to decently pen test uh, a mobile application, you need to be man in the middle between, in order to see, to have visibility uh, into the requests and responses that are being sent by the, 
by the mobile client and, and the server endpoint. So how do we do usually proceed? The easiest way of all is to simply set up in your operating system configuration settings of Android a system-wide proxy and hope that your application is using it. Right? So here I, I imported my, uh, my BERT suite intercepting proxy uh, certificate, set up my uh, configuration, and started uh, listening for requests. Unfortunately, Instagram is ignoring these settings. So my test, uh, I first tested with a browser, and indeed, I saw this request uh, coming through. But if I tried to log in with Instagram, I didn't see the request coming through my, uh, my intercepting proxy, but it did get through because it told me the password you entered is incorrect. So effectively, it's ignoring these settings, so I had to, to go a step further. So that was not a quick win. I had to go a step further, and basically, basically what I did is, if uh, the mobile application does not respect the configuration of the operating system, I have to enforce it. So I created an ad hoc Wi-Fi network with my uh, local MacBook Pro, uh, and I connected my test device on this ad hoc Wi-Fi network. So in this case, I am physically man in the middle, so there's no way for, for Instagram to, to uh, not respect this. Of course, I still need internet on my uh, MacBook Pro in order to allow the requests and responses to get sent and, and be received. So I sometimes uh, just uh, added a wire, so wired access to my MacBook Pro. But most of the time, I used uh, my personal device with USB tethering um, in order to pass it on the, the internet. Because some of this testing was done during vacations uh, next to the, the pool on, on holiday. And they don't tend to have wired access there. So that's why I, I went for the, the wireless access via the, uh, the personal phone. And this effectively worked. Um, so at the time, this, there was no SSL pinning implemented in Instagram. This has changed, but uh, that's not the topic of today. So indeed, now I could see, I, could, I remade the login request, and now I could see the, the request and responses to i.instagram.com, which is the, the endpoint domain of uh, the mobile client of Instagram. So OK, that was uh, the beginning. Now, zooming in on the login request, there was another problem. So this is the, the login request that I made, that I showed you before. And basically, it's a post request to API v1 account login. So far, so good, with only two post parameters. One is SIG key version, and one is sign body. Now, the name already reveals it. Sign body is effectively containing all the parameters that I'm, I'm sending, uh, that I've entered, so the username and the password, and even more. So you have 64 characters, then a dot, and then all the data that, that is actually being sent and, and being processed on the server side. So username ABC, password ABC, and some device identifiers sp uh, specifically for this login uh, view. Now, as you can imagine, the param parameter is called sign body. If I try to modify any of these values, which is typically something you want to do as a penetration tester. You want to be able to fiddle with some, some uh, variable, uh, uh, with some parameter values, I'm sorry. Um, if I modified only one, on one character, it told me your version of Instagram is out of date. So basically, the server is rejecting any requests that are not signed, because the 64 first characters here, it's actually an HMAC SHA-265 signature of the, the JSON uh, array that is following here. So that was a, a hurdle that I, again, had to overcome. And this was a bit more difficult than the man in the middle. Basically, I had to fish the, the key um, that they are, were using to sign this array. So I could sign my own, uh, my own uh, messages. Now, unfortunately, the key was not simply uh, in, a, in a configuration file in the uh, APK file. So I unzipped the APK file, I decompiled uh, the classes.dex file in order to get to a Java-ish code. But unfortunately, it was not a hard-coded string there. It was actually being fetched from a native library, a compiled native library that was also included in the APK. And I finally got to the point where I could fetch the, where I could look, give a look at a function that was actually returning a password, so the key that's being used to, to calculate uh, the HMAC. And unfortunately, it was also not uh, statically inside uh, the library. It was uh, being calculated dynamically. So this is the routine that they are using, but they are doing some, uh, some other calls to some, uh, some other sub methods. So this was rather hard. I, I figured maybe I, I should write a key generator for this. But what is also interesting is that this implementation changed every minor version of the Instagram Android application. So even a small update uh, changed this this key, 
So I, I would have to redo it all over again, and writing a key generator is not a, my, my core business, so it would have taken a lot of time. So I took a different approach. Instead of trying to figure out what the key is that is being calculated here, I decided to simply write a hook. Uh, you have a couple of hooking frameworks for Android. You have Cydia, you have Xpost, and last but not least, the new kit on the block is called Frida or Frida. I have actually no idea how to pronounce it. But um, with Frida, you can simply uh, choose a native method. For example, here, Scram Scrambler, which was the name of the library, the get strings uh, method. What I'm doing here is, okay, I'm, I'm attaching to the process, the Instagram process. I'm hooking this method. And on leave, so it's really a, an event handler uh, a callback, uh, I'm just outputting the, the key uh, to my terminal. Right, so now, with this code, it's pretty easy. Uh, with every new version of Instagram, I, uh, I hook this method. I trigger one calculation of, the, of a hash. So for example, I do another login request. The method gets called, and the key is spit out on my terminal on my MacBook. So that, that's a neat way to, to steal the key over and over again with every new uh, version. That was a small success, but of course, just having the key does not solve the problem. I need to use the key to, to sign all outgoing requests that I've modified. And for that, I wrote a, a burp extender plugin. Basically, with the burp intercepting tool, I'm, I'm assuming ZapProxy also has this functionality, you can write plugins. And I hooked into all outgoing requests. And I did some basic checks. OK, does it contain the parameter sign body? If yes, let's recalculate the hash based on the key and, uh, and hot patch this for all outgoing uh, requests. And it effectively worked. And what was also handy is that uh, with Burpseed, you can hook into all outgoing requests, not only generated by yourself in the repeater module, for example, but literally all outgoing requests generated by the proxy, the repeater, the intruder, the scanner. And this also allowed me to find some vulnerabilities up next. So finally, I arrived uh, here. Uh, I could start uh, pen testing, and this took me around two weeks because I was not very familiar with hooking on Android, so I had to, to teach myself. And even the man in the middle set up with uh, the MacBook in between was new for me. So um, this took me two weeks, and I didn't have, I haven't, uh, didn't pen test anything yet. I, I hadn't found anything. So now I was quite eager to start. So the vulnerabilities that I found. We've got 10, so uh, buckle up. First one was actually not on the mobile application, ironically, but it was simply on the landing page of Instagram.com, which surprised me a bit. So here we have Instagram.com, and it's presenting me the Dutch landing page because my operating system where I was testing on has uh, the Dutch language as a default. Now, you also have a language picker on the left uh, bottom of the, the page, which, which is hidden here. If you, for example, select English there, it would append the get parameter uh, HL with the value EN. So we, we see that quite often, HL for home language, I, I believe it's, that it stands. So OK, um, I figured. Typically, if, when I see this case, I figure perhaps this value is used in, in a calculation of, of a, a language path. So uh, typically, to test for, a, for path uh, injection, I add dot forward slash, because this is legitimate in a, in a path string. And effectively, this still uh, served me the English web page, which is not the default one for my case. The default one is in Dutch. So this value is effectively accepted as uh, being an identifier for English. This does not confirm the, the vulnerability yet. So I went ahead and tried to fetch another file. So go, by going up a couple of directories and trying to read etc passwords, appended with a null byte to uh, null out anything that is uh, appended on the server side to this uh, value. But unfortunately, the response said, oops, an error occurred. So it's not effectively rejecting this value, but it cannot serve me a decent response. So this. Uh, I was a bit stuck here. And after a while, I decided to look into the documentation of Django, because Instagram is written in, uh, in Django from Python, in Python. And yeah, you can learn about this on their engineering blog, which is really a, a treasure trove when you're bug bounty hunting. First, uh, check out the engineering blog of, uh, of the company. They usually give some hints about the technologies they are using, and that uh, proved to be very uh, interesting here, very useful. So here you can uh, see a reference to language files in Django, Django conf local, and then a language code, a dynamic language code, LC messages Django.bo, which is a language file uh, extension. So I figured, OK, maybe if this is effectively where my value is being inserted in, I can go up one directory 
and test whether, whether this is effectively the locale directory. So I tried this with this following value, hl equals dot dot for slash locale slash en, which should be the same as simply en. And as you can see, again, the language, uh, the, the English uh, landing page was served, so hereby confirming that I have a, an actual path traversal or, or path injection vulnerability found on the landing page. Now, what can you do with it? That's, uh, that's something different. First of all, what I could do is read, for example, slash dev slash u random. This is uh, on Linux a uh, file. Well, it's not a file, but it keeps on uh, giving you random uh, a string, uh, continuous uh, uh, flow of, of, of random characters. So that could result in application denial of service. And also what I, what I found out is, yeah, of course, in order to completely confirm it, I, I replaced locale with a, an unexisting directory, and it served me the Dutch page, so that confirmed it completely. And what I did also is I tried to brute force directory names from other directories, so I, I learned about locale from the documentation, so I started to brute force some others. I picked a, a word list of popular directory names from the FuzzDB project, which might uh, be known to, to some of you. And I got not less than 42 uh, hits. So I found out a couple of sensitive names that I, I had to redact in this uh, presentation, a couple of sensitive directory names in the same directory where the locale directory was uh, located. And essentially, this vulnerability would also allow me to brute force all uh, directories on uh, the production server of uh, www.instagram.com. So that was my first success. So I reported it to them, and I was quite happy because yeah, I found a vulnerability. And unfortunately, they re responded to me, although this issue does not qualify as part of, a, of our bug bounty program, we appreciate your report. So that was, that was kind of a bummer, right? Because I could effectively bring down a lot of servers from them just by feeding slash dev slash u random. I could brute force, for example, the home users, uh, so the users on their Linux, Linux system by brute forcing the home directory. So that, that seemed to me like an issue. So I, I elaborated a bit, and then they, they came around and told me ah, that that response was for, intended for a completely other report, so uh, yours is valid, and here's $500. So at the time, I, I <laughs> this, was, this was better. <laughs> but still, if you, if you think about it, $500 is their minimum uh, bounty amount. It's not very high for something that could have brought down a lot of that could have majorly affected their, their availability, but left aside, I was, uh, I was still very happy. Second vulnerability, also still not on the mobile uh, application space, uh, actually uh, maybe even simpler. So if you register a, a new account, in this case, victim 14 April, on the 14th of April, I, I, I tried this uh, attack, um, it sends you a mail to confirm your email address, very typical. And if you click the link, it takes you to the following URL, Instagram.com account, confirm email, run, well, a user identifier, and then a base64 encoded um, value, which is effectively holding your email address. So if you base64 decode this, it was Instagram user at gmail.com in this case. So I had to visit this link, and in order to activate or confirm my email address, I had to log in with the account to which this new email address was linked. Now, I didn't do that. I just logged in with another Instagram account and see what, uh, what the message was. And it effectively detected that this was not the correct account. And it told me, no, you're logged in as attacker 14 April, but you have to log in as victim 14 April. So you're not, it's actually leaking the username that is attached to a, an email address. And that's not allowed because email addresses are guaranteed to be uh, private data on Instagram according to their documentation. So, this was a vulnerability, but I, I always like to offer a decent proof of concept. So I went ahead and base64 encoded the, ver the email address mark.zuckerberg at facebook.com. And effectively, it told me, no, that's, uh, that's not correct. You have to log in with username the Mark Zuckerberg on Instagram. So basically, it's an oracle allowing me to guess email addresses, and it tells me the username, which is not a very big deal. But maybe in, uh, in censored environments where internet is, is monitored, for activists, this might be a deal. So I went out, I, 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 uh, I reported it to them, and this was a better outcome. They, they fixed it in like one day and a half, and they donated $750 for this very simple vulnerability. So that was a, a, good, uh, a good success. 
Now, the third vulnerability I can unfortunately not disclose at this moment because it's still not fixed by Facebook. I reported this, ironically, on 9-11 uh, uh, of last year. And I already received a bounty for this one in February because they told me ah, it's taking us more time than expected, but you already get, uh, get your bounty now. And I asked them a couple of weeks ago whether it's already fixed, and I, I can disclose it here, but unfortunately, they are still working on it. So this also shows that you sometimes, as a bug bounty hunter, you have to have a lot of patience as well from your side. So uh, I will certainly disclose this vulnerability as well later, uh, probably on my blog or, or another presentation, but not for now. Uh, fourth vulnerability is finally uh, in the mobile uh, application. Uh, Instagram, it's all about pictures, right? So I tried to use this functionality and I uploaded a picture. And the response of the upload request was the following. Um, basically, a lot of gibberish, and I highlighted the interesting parts. First of all, your uploaded image gets an ID, a very long one. It's not a UUID, but uh, it comes close. It's hard to brute force. And the ID is actually used internally to refer to the image. So this is the, the real unique identifier. But it also gets a code, which is also unique to the image. But the code is not really being used internally. It's actually being used in the path of the link on the, the main website to this picture. So you see dash E1 and, and uh, 10 characters in total. And if you browse to Instagram.com slash P slash the, the code, if you're allowed to view the picture, you would see the picture. Now, I did the test with a private account, so I uploaded a picture with a private account, and then I then went to, uh, to this URL unauthenticated, and as expected, you cannot see the, the, the picture. Now, if the private account is logged in, so the owner of the picture is logged in, he or she can see the picture. So, so far, so good. Now, there is one piece of functionality in the mobile application that allows to modify the access control around this picture. So you can, on a, on a picture of your own, you can uh, select copy share URL. And basically, it will give, send the following get request, so API v1 media your picture ID of your proper own picture, slash permalink, and it would reply the permalink that we actually already knew about. But now the access control around this picture has changed. Now it has become widely available to everyone. Now why does this functionality exist? I'm assuming that Instagram made this functionality in order for their users to be able to share pictures with um, users who don't have an Instagram account. So basically they're allowing to give you a URL to the picture and you can visit it without a, a decent Instagram account. So now the whole world can view this picture from a private account, although the private account will probably only share it with a couple of friends, uh, with, with uh, the people he or she wants to share it with. And at this point, I figured out, OK, actually, the only thing that withholds me as an attacker to discover all these private account pictures that have been deliberately shared by the owner with a couple of people is the entropy of this token here. So the code that was generated previously, 10, 10 characters. Now the alphabet uh, of each character is 64 characters, so it's a lot of uh, possibilities. It's hard to brute force. But I started to investigate, and I found some patterns. So the first pattern that I found was um, every Instagram account has a unique user ID, and it's an incremental ID. So for example, the founders, Kevin and Mikey, they have ID three and four. And I, I just, uh, these are public accounts, so I can view all the permalinks of their pictures. And I noticed that the seventh and eighth character of the, the, the code of their, their permalink pictures are almost the same. The seventh character is always the, the, the same. No, the eighth character is always the same. It's a B, as you can see. And the seventh character is either an, a G or an A. Now, this was the case for user accounts or accounts with a user ID which were close to each other. Uh, I also did a test with uh, Britney Spears and, and a random account that was very close to, to her user ID. And it were different characters, as you can see, but the, the pattern remained. So as an attacker, that's interesting uh, information because if I have a private account, I know the, the UUID of a private account, that's public information. I can just search for some public accounts uh, near this uh, unique ID, and I can discover two of the 10 uh, characters that are needed for these uh, URLs. That's already something, but, but that's not enough. That still leaves eight, uh, uh, 64 to the 8, which is a, a lot uh, of possibilities. So I had to step, go a step further, and I implemented a, a small Python script 
script which basically monitors a private account, a public profile page, and the public profile page of a private account, it does not show any pictures, but it shows how many pictures have been posted by this account. So basically, this Python script is monitoring the number of posts or number of pictures that have been uploaded by this private account, and once it increments, it will immediately upload an, a picture uh, as well, but with an attacker account. Right, so completely different Instagram account, it would upload a picture. And then I, I gathered some, some samples uh, with two test accounts, obviously, and I, I listed the, the codes that were generated for both pictures. And effectively, uh, this proved to me that the first six characters of the code are actually based on time. And with this Python script, with this monitor script, which is pretty fast at, uh, at uploading a new picture, I could steadily uh, detect the, the first four characters, which reduces the entropy enormously. Because if we do the math now, we have four well-known characters. The, the seventh and the eighth we can, we can already predict, so that only leaves four. So 64 possibilities per character to the fourth times two, because the, remember the eighth character can be of two values. It gives you 33 million possibilities, which is easy to brute force nowadays with a, a simple brute force tool. Uh, trying to fetch 33 million uh, URLs, it only takes a couple of hours with a, with a performance, at least with a server who has a good uplink. So I could essentially, as an uh, attacker, start brute forcing uh, URLs of a, a private account and land on picture that they have, private picture that, for which they have the generated this permalink. So it's a long fetch, but uh, I finally ended there. And Facebook went along and they, they acknowledged and, and, and fixed this by making the code a lot longer. And they, they gave me 1,000 uh, US dollar. OK. Now, maybe anyone noticed in the previous vulnerability, if you select copy share URL, the underlying, uh, the underlying uh, mobile application, so the Instagram application, is generating a GET request to the server. But basically, this should not have been a GET request because it's, it's a stateful uh, action. This request. Uh, changes the access control around this permalink, this, this picture uh, on this URL. And what's even worse is um, post requests to the API endpoint are properly protected against CSERF, but get, get requests are not. Uh, Tom Van Goetem talked about this uh, in the previous presentation as well. So typically, CSRF is only being used to protect post requests. And here we have a get request. So this allows me, as an attacker, if I can lure an authenticated uh, victim, uh, Instagram uh, account victim, to my website. I can make this request on their behalf, and I can share their pictures on their behalf without them knowing. So if it's a private account, I can make their, uh, their uh, pictures public, which is a big deal. Now, in order to, do, to successfully execute the CSERF, I still needed two uh, informations. First of all, I needed the image ID of a private picture of my victim, which is not public information. Of course, they are not visible, so you cannot fetch this information. And with CSERF, you cannot read the response, so I also had to, to have a way to predict the, the final permalink of this picture. As you can see, the, the token grew a lot longer, but still the CSERF vulnerability was still there. So I had to use some leakage uh, vulnerabilities. First of all, I found a way to discover image IDs of private account pictures, simply uh, with a simple insecure direct object reference uh, in an endpoint that uh, allows me to fetch the new pictures in which uh, I have been tagged. So it, if the victim was tagged in a new picture, he, he, he made a uh, picture and he tagged a couple of people among which himself or herself, um, I could essentially fetch uh, the, the image ID. So that was already one part of the, the problem. The second one that allowed me to discover the permalinks was, again, in the same endpoint here, in the permalink endpoint. I could simply exchange the image ID of myself, or a picture of myself, with the image ID that I now discovered, and it would return to me the URL. It would not modify the access control around it, because that would have been a very nice case, but it would, it would leak the, the URL. So uh, complicated c surf attack. Uh, Facebook acknowledged they fixed it. They made it a post request. And they also rewarded $1,000. So we're halfway. Um, and now, as you might have noticed, the bounties keep on rising. So now the, the very interesting ones uh, start coming. Um, here is a, a case of 
Um, yeah, let me explain. So if you have an Instagram account and you want to change your password, you have to supply your old password. It's best practice, it's common practice. Now, if you want to change your email address, which can be used to reset your password, you didn't have to supply your current password. This was actually a bypass around this, I thought. So I went ahead and I changed the email address. And to the new email address that I entered, I got the same confirmation email um, to confirm it. But there was also an email sent to the old email address saying, hey, somebody has changed your email address. Was it not you? In case it was not you, click here to, to secure your account again. And basically, this here gave you the option to reset your password again, so to reclaim your account in case someone else changed your email address. So this is uh, their protection against this uh, scenario, which is a bit odd. I would just, uh, I advise them to just ask for the password when changing the email address, but it's a way. Now, the attack scenario that I came up here uh, for this case was, imagine that an attacker has temporary access to an authenticated session of a victim. For example, through SSL pinning, which was uh, still possible uh, until the end of last year. Uh, through a cross-site scripting vulnerability, through uh, physical access to an unlocked phone, for example, when, when somebody is visiting uh, the bathroom uh, in the pub. And yeah, the attacker has like a couple of seconds to fiddle on an authenticated session. What he could do then is change the email address of the victim not once, but twice. Right? He would change it to the first email address under his control and then a second one, which would, um, and then he would proceed with the reset password uh, scenario. Now, in this case, the attacker has control of the account, but the victim still has a reclaim back link. But the attacker also has one, and you see where, where this is going. So in this uh, case, the victim would utilize his link or her link to reclaim back the account. And here was the vulnerability. The reclaim link that was sent to the first email address of the attacker was still working. So finally, the attacker could use this link and completely overtake the account. And there's no way that Instagram is uh, explaining in their documentation to get this account back. So it's an account takeover based on temporary access uh, to a victim's uh, account. And surprisingly enough, they, uh, they reward this quite generously because it's a uh, it's some uh, prerequisite, but they, they gave $2,000 for this one. Okay, up next is co something completely different. It was about stealing money from Instagram. Um, in Instagram, you can link a uh, phone number, so a mobile phone number to your account. And the registration process goes as follows. You enter the mobile number, they send you a code, you have to enter it, and then you're linked, right? But if you don't enter the code, after three minutes, they will call you, or at least that's what they, they say in the, in the application. So I figured out, okay, let's play the waiting game, let's see if they call me. And effectively, they, are, they were calling me, so they were calling from California to Belgium, which is quite an expensive call for them, but they were calling me, and uh, they were effectively, uh, yeah, I cannot, I don't have sound here today, but it's basically saying your code for Instagram is one, two, three, four, five, six, but in a very computerized voice. So the attack scenario that I came up here is let's not enter my own test device's uh, phone number, but let's enter a premium number and see if they call this number, which is a valid, uh, valid attack scenario in my opinion. So I looked around on the internet for uh, providers of premium numbers and there's a lot of scams there, so you have to look out. But I finally found eurocall24.com, which allows you to pick an, uh, a whole bunch of, uh, of premium numbers. And I went ahead, I registered one in United Kingdom I entered it on the mobile application, and I watched on their, their live incoming calls dashboard that effectively I received a call from the same number in California to this premium number. So at this point, Instagram was giving me money. And it was getting better because I could not make one call, I could make multiple calls. There was, not, there was some uh, rate, limitation, uh, rate limiting protection. Um, I only could make one call every 30 seconds but it was unlimited per account. So I could just easily make a, a, a nice loop and I could keep on calling my own premium number. So I did a proof of concept uh, to call 60 times and with a, a throttle of 30 seconds in between. And this ended up with uh, one pound. Yeah, it's a, it's a UK website. So one pound was, uh, was earned. So this is the point where I thought, okay, this proof of concept is, is good enough, I will, I will send it to them. 
and I got the following response. This is intentional behavior in our product. We do not consider it a security vulnerability, but do have uh, controls in place to monitor and mitigate abuse. Which was not very, uh, it, it was not what I expected. I was actually quite disappointed. But then it came to me, hmm, this is intentional behavior in our product. <laughs> this is actually even better than just a, a small bounty. I can, I have black and white that I, this is intentional, so I can, I can make a living out of this, right? So I had a moral dilemma, <laughs> but I decided to, to, uh, to contact them again and tell them, okay, the proof of concept, indeed, I cannot steal an, oh, a big load of money because I only used one account, but I can easily create 100 accounts, set up 100 loops, and steal more than $140,000 a month. And at this point, they came round and they acknowledged, <laughs> yes, now we're talking. <laughs> uh, and, and they gave me $2,000 uh, eventually. So that's a completely uh, a, another kind of a attack scenario. Eight vulnerability is actually the most simple one I've, I've found. Basically, what I do with every new uh, version of Instagram, uh, mobile, mobile Android application of Instagram, I decompile it to the Java-ish code, and I extract the strings. And um, basically, I do this to identify new endpoints that are in the, in the code. And I stumbled upon discover slash su refill, a new endpoint, and I tried to, to trigger it by using the mobile application, but it was not, never making a request to this endpoint. So I had a new endpoint, but I didn't know how to speak to it. So I dived into the, the obfuscated decompiled Java code, and here you can see discover su refill was the endpoint that was uh, in this class, and it also leaked some information about parameters that is what it was expecting. Target ID was a, an interesting one because IDs are always uh, interesting for insecure direct object references. So I went ahead and I forged an, uh, a request in the repeater tool based on a, an existing uh, request. And I sent a cookie from an attacker Instagram account and a target ID um, from a victim uh, test account. So there was no relationship between these two accounts and this one was a private one. So actually I could not fetch or normally see a lot of information of this one. And the response, uh, luckily, it showed uh, some decent information. Basically, it is returning the users that this victim account, so the target ID values account, is following, which is considered private information. And Facebook rewarded. They also fixed this like in an hour, because uh, yeah, it's, it's simply an access control check that they have to add. And they gave $2,500 for like five minutes of work. So that was uh, very nice. Ninth vulnerability, uh, this one I've also posted on my blog, so maybe it's, uh, it's known to some of you. Uh, I mainly did testing in 2015, and then uh, I stopped for, for a couple of months because, with Christmas and, and, and holidays. And uh, in February, I tried to log into my account again, and it told me, hmm, you've been uh, quite inactive for a couple of months, so maybe we need to reactivate you. We want to check uh, for sure that, that it's, it is you that is logging in. So I could verify by email. Now, the interesting case here is already highlighted. My unique user ID, which is, remember, incremental, uh, is in the URL. So as a pen tester, obviously, you want to try another user ID there and see what you get. And I started to enumerate one million um, user IDs which were close to, to mine. And I stumbled upon some interesting results. So some, most of the pages gave a 404. But some uh, gave uh, the following screen, so also a reactivation uh, of the lockout, but through a captcha. Only 0.1% of the, the 1 million accounts, though. 0.2% gave me the screen that I received, so to verify your account again by SMS or email, but still, it's not very interesting for an attacker, because this is the profile picture that is already public, so it's not very interesting. Up next was more interesting. 0.17% uh, uh, of the, the mil 1 million accounts, they allowed me on this screen to update the email address, which is, remember, it allows me to overtake the account through the reset password. That was already nice, but 0.17% is not a lot. And luckily for me, I also landed on almost 4% of, uh, of screens that allow me to update the phone number and just like with the email address, you can also reset the password of an account if it has a linked phone number. 
And even better for some, uh, it also showed the previous phone number. So it's clearly a, a leakage of private information. And this escalated, uh, I escalated this quickly to Facebook, and I believe they fixed it in, in 12 hours or something. And they, they uh, donated me $5,000, which was very nice because I didn't test for a couple of months. I landed on a lookout page, and suddenly I, was, I received $5,000. So thumbs up for lookout. Last but not least, uh, final vulnerability. Um, it's about authentication, credentials, brute force. Basically, Instagram, um, as I've told you, the usernames are public, and they, have a, they are enumerable because they're, they're U, UUIDs, they are incremental. So you, basically, an attacker can easily build a list of all the usernames of Instagram. And it's, it's the username that you need to use to, to log in. It's not uh, the email address. So usernames are known. They have a very weak password policy, so it allowed passwords like password, which is very common, one, two, three, four, five, six, it was also allowed. And they don't have two-factor authentication, so it's a good target uh, for testing uh, credential uh, brute forcing, because with a, a nice list of uh, password dictionaries, you, you, could, uh, you could compromise a lot of accounts. And this is where my plugin really proved himself, my Burp Extender plugin really proved himself. Here you can see uh, an account uh, lockout, no, an account brute force attack on the mobile authentication endpoint. So literally entering credentials and replaying this in Burp Intruder. And as you can see, until the attempt number 1000, it would tell me whether the password that I guessed is right or wrong. But from that moment on, it would tell me, no, the username you entered doesn't appear to, to belong to an account. While obviously uh, the, the username is static in this, in this loop, so obviously, the, the account is still existing. This is simple rate limitation protection. So if I made uh, the same attack from another IP address, I could again make, uh, make 1,000 uh, uh, requests. So OK, they had some protection. <laughs> but I left this running for a while. And on number 2,000, so att after attempt number 2,000, it started differentiating between the username you entered doesn't appear to belong to an account and a valid response saying the password you entered is incorrect or correct. I have no clue who implemented this and why this was wrong, but basically the rate limitation protection was nullified after 2,000 attempts. The only downside is I had, to, I had to make two requests for one answer, but it's easily scriptable, so I went ahead and scripted this, and this allowed me to very uh, quickly uh, discover the password of an account. So that was the first one. Actually, I found a second one, and I promised you it was in the registration on the desktop um, website, so the main website of Instagram. And here, if you register an account, it would send the following request to accounts web create Ajax. And I decided to replay this account and to also remove the, uh, everything except the email and the password, because the rest is, is added uh, by JavaScript. And if I replay this uh, request with the password that I registered with, it would tell me those credentials belong to an active Instagram account. But if I would replay this request with another password, so wrong password, it would tell me, hmm, email required exception. So basically, it's an oracle that can be used to verify whether my password guess is right or wrong. And there was no rate limitation on this one, not even after 1,000 or 2,000 or 5,000 uh, attempts. So I reported these separately. Yeah, I also did a proof of concept. The, the guest number 10,001 still revealed that the password was correct, so this confirmed the vulnerability. And Facebook uh, also uh, fixed these uh, vulnerabilities and paid out $5,000. So that's it um, for now. <laughs> <laughs> to conclude, uh, in total, Facebook gave me $20,500, which is a, a nice payout. But of course, I had, to, I had to do my best for that. And actually, they, they donated a bit more money because the first $5,000 that I earned, I gave to a charity, and they doubled it. So in total, they gave almost $25,000, and the charity was also very happy. So uh, that was nice. And maybe some advice for those who are already bug bounty hunting or, or wanting to get into it. If you are hunting for bugs, keep calm and try harder. You sometimes really have to go a step further than typically to find something. If you're reporting, be patient. I'm still waiting for some reports which are months and months old, but patience uh, is a virtue. And if you're uh, disclosing, be responsible. So don't disclose anything that isn't fixed yet because you will ruin the relationship with, uh, with the company as well. Thank you for your attention, and uh, I'd be happy to take any questions you have. Website challenge. 
Well, uh, I, I mentioned HackerOne and BookCrowd in the beginning of my talk. These are actually platforms where a lot of companies can register themselves and yeah, they, they post the scope of their book bounty program. And researchers can also make an account and you can send reports in a, in a decent fashion to them and they get triaged. So this would be, would be uh, what I would advise. You have a lot of programs there. What I did, I first started with smaller companies just to, to get the, the, the feeling and then I, I mainly chose, my, uh, chose Instagram because I didn't see too many write-ups. So uh, you have a, a number of, at the time, one year ago, you only had the, the big ones, but these days you literally have, for example, Tesla, for example, Slack, they have a bug bounty program, so there's a lot of choice, actually. Yes, please. You had a, a search from what they could do in this program. Mm-hmm. It's a good question, and, uh, sorry? Ah, yes, indeed, so the question is, um, the vulnerability where I'm waiting for the fix for more than 10 months, um, have I set for myself a date that I will responsibly disclose anyway, uh, for example, through a blog post? Well, I have been in doubt about that, honestly, but um, on the other hand, some issues are easier to fix than others, and this particular one does not have an easy easy fix with, with one uh, one liner of code. So I understand that this takes some um, more time. But of course, it, if, if it takes 10 years, I will not wait. But uh, I haven't set a fixed date personally for myself yet. Uh, but it's, uh, it's a common problem with bug bounty hunting. Sometimes you have to wait for a long time, and it's, it can be frustrating indeed. Any other questions? Yes, please. Well, um, in the mobile application, uh, indeed, the, the question was, um, did I face any additional protections or any lockout mechanisms from Instagram uh, on the brute, for, brute force attack? Well, it is true that uh, if you don't use an account for a couple of months, they ask you to uh, re-verify your email address. But if I brute force the password of an active account and then logged in through an IP address in Hong Kong or, or China, it's just let me in, so there was no location-based uh, anomaly detection or anything. I didn't uh, hit any protection besides a rate limitation based on IP address. Good question, thank you. So the question is, do I agree with the payout, the rewards that they have given me for each vulnerability? The logical answer, not always. I think some vulnerabilities deserve them a higher reward, relatively. I think some were generously rewarded. But at the end, it's at their discretion. I cannot influence it, or, or hardly. So that's the life of a bug bounty hunter. You have to comply with, with their decision. But as I mentioned, uh, for example, the first one that allowed me to bring down a lot of uh, main servers, I believe this might have, have, have yielded a, a higher payout, for example. But in the end, that's, that's a bit part of the game if you're bug bounty hunting. So indeed, advice uh, if you disclose for a, a write-up. Well, I typically ask the company first. I make a draft on my, on my blog. I give it to them uh, for them to, to have a proofread. So I, I try to have their buy-in for my, for my write-up before publishing. Sometimes I do give a hint or two about a reward or give some comments on it. And if you give them the opportunity to validate, then you won't have any problem. That's, that's at least my reasoning. That's what I did. Uh, Oh, I'm sorry, yeah, the, so the question was uh, not the write-up that I publish afterwards, but the report that I, that I submit. Well, I always try to submit a real proof of concept because bug bounty programs, they receive a lot of submissions which are vague and not really a proof of concept, which are theoretical vulnerabilities. And I do know that this is more a burden on their end and it will never get accepted. So I first try to make a decent proof of concept and then send this over, so to minimize the, the number of uh, yeah, rejected uh, reports. 
So that's, that's indeed a, a good advice I can share. Okay, let's take a <laughs> Thank you for your attention. <laughs>